All right, thank you, everyone. Uh, I'm going to take you on a bit of a journey, uh, my journey into uh, death work and to art and community. So, so it goes. Looking back to a moment where I began, this journey is complicated. Uh, the threads of a lifetime cross, they weave over one another. One thing I do remember is being drawn to sitting with trauma. When I was a kid, I was maybe 12 years old. <laughs> it's all right. We're doing this together? All right. So I was about 12 years old. I remember a winter morning, I was out delivering newspapers, and I saw a car slide off the road and into a ditch. I ran to the car, and in the driver's seat, there was an older woman who was, as I look back, possibly suffering from a heart attack. She was obviously dying. A bystander went to call for help, and I stayed with her until the ambulance came. I remember the feeling of knowing that she was dying. She was ashen and her breathing was shallow, but I felt calm alongside her. I felt then it was important that she not be alone. Years later, after graduating from college, I was driving down the road at night and came upon another accident. A car had run a stop sign crashing into an embankment. The driver was critically injured, barely conscious, unable to speak from the severe facial wounds. I ran to get help and then came back and stayed with him until the ambulance arrived. And again, there was a feeling of serenity holding his bloody hand until help arrived. I saw this as a calling, but the next time I wanted to do more, I wanted to go farther, and shortly after I trained in emergency medicine. I worked as a paramedic for quite a few years, tending to people in their most vulnerable moments of their lives, and that gave me a profound sense and a deep understanding of our own vulnerability, how quickly life can change in any given moment, and really how our life stories change. I saw a lot of death, but in a way, I felt that bearing witness to those moments was a gift. But there was a point later in my career where things began to shift. There was a call to a potential cardiac arrest. We arrived, lights and sirens, and the old man, and up the steps with our bags, our drugs and our equipment. It was an old home on the east side, and an old man had lived there, obviously for a long time, maybe a lifetime. The man was on his carpeted floor, his family distraught, and no idea what to do. A daughter insisted that we had a do not resuscitate order, but without the legal paperwork, we were bound by law to do everything we could. So they continued CPR. I could hear his brittle ribs cracking under the firefighter's hands. I remember taking in the room, the smell, the photos on the walls, wondering who the people were. What did they mean to this man whose head I held between my knees before forcing the endotracheal tube past his vocal cords? We forced oxygen into his lungs and gave him enough drugs to bring a pulses to a stone. And all the while, I was filled with resentment. We should be sitting in the parking lot still, reading books and listening to NPR. The old man should have passed away gently in his favorite chair, surrounded by his children. But here we are, in bloody gauze and strangers and orchestrated chaos. And to make matters worse, my partner announced with excitement of a new trainee that we had pulses. I cursed under my breath, told the firefighters to get the backboards, and we strapped the old man down. Bags of medication flowing into his arms, keeping him alive, and while forcing air into his lungs. I told the family to follow us to the hospital, and I knew in my heart that he was going to die shortly after, either in the emergency room or an intensive care unit. And the family would be hit with thousands of dollars of bills, and he would die alone in a sterile room, away from his home, and the family would not be allowed ceremony or time with his body in that sacred place. And I knew that I never wanted to do that again. At the time, I didn't have words for it, but I knew there had to be a better way. And now, along with many others, uh, I'm on the road to what feels like a better way. As much as we try to resist, endings happen in every moment, the end of a breath, the end of a day, the end of a relationship, and ultimately the end of life. And in each of these endings, there's a beginning, but we do not always know what that will look like. We live in a time of death, extinctions, pandemics, climate crises, and the upturning of social orders. But in that turmoil also lies new beginnings and new opportunities. When we learn to, do, to befriend death, we develop resiliency and find new ways to navigate our next steps, our next breaths, and our new relationship to the world. It's important to realize that life death is a situation of relationship. When we can live our lives openly and honestly and we see the natural state of the world as it truly is and not from where an ego, ego needs it to be, 
It helps us understand that death is not in opposition to life, but inseparable from the life force. Death folds into life, and life emerges from death. The death positive movement in America evolved alongside the sex positivity movement. So it's no surprise that at its core, the movement is feminist. And an act of resistance, acknowledging bodily autonomy and community over medicalized patriarchal practices. Other radical cultural movements had major influences in the way we were forced to deal with death openly. During the AIDS epidemic, there we go. During the AIDS epidemic, gay men's love and suffering made life death the politics real in a way that became undeniable to the broader public. Because of this tragedy, end of life conversations and a nascent hospice movement became part of our public conversations. The Chicano movement in the 1970s rose up resisting cultural assimilation and fighting for workers' rights and cultural autonomy. And from this, Dia de Muertos, the Day of the Dead, was brought from family traditions to public celebrations as a way to celebrate Chicano heritage. Today, we are seeing more and more end-of-life care facilitators. Death or end-of-life doulas mirror birth doulas in completing the life-death circle. While both vacations are still mostly operating outside the corporate health structure, it's my opinion that this is for the best. A major player in the modern death movement is an organization founded by a mortician, Caitlin Doherty, called the Order of the Good Death. They believe, and this is from their seven tenets of the good death, that by hiding death and dying behind closed doors, we do more harm than good to society. And that a culture of silence around death should be broken through discussion, through gatherings, art, and innovation, and scholarship. This organization has been a valuable resource and advocate for death aware acts of cultural change and reclamation of things such as death cafes, home funerals, death cafes, home funerals, and green burials, and body composting, to name a few. Around 2016, me and some like-minded folks started doing some death work locally here, where like-minded people worked on acquiring green burial space and starting monthly death cafe meetings. The organization, organization I co-founded with Jennifer Townsend there in the bone shirt, um, Daylight and Darkness goes beyond the open format of death cafes and encourages deeper prompted conversations, art, uh, grief, death work, book clubs, and even movie nights. So this here uh, is one thing we did at the uh, one of the uh, workshops. Um, we had this rope machine where basically we had pieces of yarn. Everyone get a skein of yarn, and we tie it together along with little stories we'd write in fabric. They could be stories of a loved one, stories of themselves, how they feel about death, um, different themes. We had different stories, but the idea is as we tie the skeins of yarn together, we tie our stories together, and then it was done we would all have a rope that we would share with all of our stories tied together. Uh, it was a really nice way to sort of get people's bodies moving together and really start realizing how well, how stories change and how they still stay tied together. Uh, in the middle there, that's Debbie Eisenbeis. Uh, she's also a local death doula. Um, right before COVID hit, we were planning a uh, mortality festival, and so we had music, art, poetry, uh, an opportunity for people to stand up and uh, grieve, talk about loved ones. Uh, unfortunately, that was April 2020, and everything shut down right before we were able to have that. So hopefully we'll have this again soon. Okay. I teach classes, and I had the sculpture department at the Kalamazoo Institute of Arts. Uh, this year, I began teaching a class on making memento mores. Uh, for those who don't know, memento mori is a Latin phrase, meaning remember that you must die. Uh, memento mori is a common theme in art, depicting dancing skeletons, table settings with skull and wilting flowers. Uh, in my class, we learned about ceremonial death arts across cultures, 
We created space for sharing personal stories of death and grief. And we made personal memento mores to remind us that life is ephemeral and that we need to live fully in every moment. This is one um, uh, cremation urn I made for a friend and a client. It was for her father who was a hunter. Um, part of the work I'd like to do is have my clients design and get a hand in the work so the body experience is part of the grieving process. I believe that's very important. Um, this is another urn I made potentially for my own ashes. There's a little space on top for burning sage. Again, memento mori, the idea is making objects so we are always aware that we are mortal and that we will pass. So they're constant reminders. Any day could be our last. Uh, here is, I was making a hand cast of um, my co-founder of Daylight and Darkness, Jen Townsend. Her mother passed away. So um, we took a casting of her hand. So she would always have a hand to hold of her mother's. This isn't that one, but this is another one of a, uh, a woman holding her dying mother's hand. And these are some shots of uh, the Pimento Mori class. We would light a candle before every class, blow it out with intention. We made death masks. These were a ball. Um, death masks were created um, in the 1800s. They were common for artists to use to create sculptures and paintings from uh, living people or the dying or the dead. Um, other other cultures would also create masks of the dead and then use them in other ritualistic ceremonies. What we did was we uh, we would have the person uh, lay down and contemplate their death and their dying. And then uh, another classmate would take the role of um, basically putting the silicone over the person's face. And their responsibility was um, literally had their life in their hands. You had to put the uh, silicone over their face and make sure there were nose holes so they could breathe. And so they were reminded that their life was literally in their hands of the responsibility. And so it was really about this connection between the two. And when that um, silicone's over your face, it takes a while to dry. Okay, and the plaster goes on, that takes a good 15 minutes for that to dry. And while you're there, you're encased and it's really suffocating feeling. And you can hear your classmates around you and the music that we played. So it was really part of a ritual to really engage people in that idea of their own death. Okay, and for the living to be responsible for that person around them. So, and there are some pretty fun results. Paula loved this piece. She just showed it to her mom. It just freaked her out. I don't recognize you. Let me see. I'm trying to advance it. Help me out, Steve. Cool. Um, this is Krista. She did quite a few paintings on her. She did quite a few castings of her face. And she was very moved by the experience. I think being in that space and hearing the people around her, she just said it uh, repeatedly. It really changed her, uh, changed her expectations her, of life. And we worked in multi, multiple medias. If someone had something that they were drawn to, we were able to expand and try to help facilitate that for everyone. This is Anna Ill. She does, she's a wonderful sculptor. And this is a play, uh, piece representing uh, her thoughts on the climate crisis and uh, a grieving mother nature. You go to the next one. Yeah. And yeah, next one. Uh, Lauren Tripp was a jeweler, and she is a jeweler, so she created these little memento mores. She made multiples, gave it to the entire class. Little keychain so you can hold it in your hand and see it every day. Okay, next one. Um, these, and I think the uh, the next few ones are what I called funereal stones. Um, the idea I came up with these were creating a small stone out of ceramics, ceramic, and realizing that they would hold your own ashes after your death, or maybe the ashes of someone that you know who may be dying. Um, you'd make multiples so you can maybe hand them out to family members who can each have a piece of you. Um, there's a hole in them for the ashes to be put into. So if you did create them for yourself, they could be sitting on a shelf uh, knowing that eventually they would be the home for your remains. Um, the dent on top is your thumbprint. So whoever would be holding these after you died would have a feeling of where your hand actually was. You can actually see the fingerprints in the stones. 
some people got creative. This one is kind of like a little shaker. So you can take it out and shake the ashes wherever you wanted. You want to spread the ashes. Okay, next one. Okay, next one. And these, um, the last class we did, we all made these stones and cast them in the yard. We had a separate ceremony after class. We all got together and sat around the fire in conversation. And these are pit fired in our backyard. Beginning of class, I would pick some flowers and we just watched the flowers decay as the class went on. Okay. So, as I discussed earlier, death awareness is important not only in how we approach our and our loved one's final moments, it's integral to understanding how we move through the smaller deaths we face every day. All of our life changes involve life death cycles, embracing a new gender identity, a new job, divorce, bankruptcy. These all break us down, and fortunately in our culture, unfortunately, it's difficult to find space to move through these moments consciously and with intention. In Tibetan Buddhism, the bardo is used to describe the liminal space one spirit occupies between death and rebirth. It's a space of choice. In its metaphorical context, the bardo is a space where life as we know it becomes suspended, an opportunity for spiritual progress or soul work can occur. Entry into the life of soul, a life of passion and service, demands a deep price, a psycholog psychological form of dying. We don't easily give up on our understanding of a life, which is often a faint idea of a life and one of extended adolescence. Nature-based societies understand this, traditionally providing persons with extensive preparations for their encounters with the soul. Followed by an argu arduous initiation rites, these rites, these rituals facilitate a shift of consciousness that is required to turn our focus from concerns of the daily world and cross the threshold to those of the soul. This past summer, I was participating in a rites of passage ceremony. For myself, the retreat was to facil facilitate my life stage transition to elderhood. We spent a week in daily ceremony, each of us honing our separate intentions as we talked, cried, and sang them into being. We listened with open hearts to the whispers of nature, earth, and animal and ancestral. Animal and ancestral. What followed that week of work was a solo a four-day vision fast into the mountains. With only water, a tarp, a sleeping bag, a few personal items, and totems, I walked a spirit on the land, listening and watching the world around and within me with new eyes. On the third day, I prepared for what is called the Death Lodge. Of the many ceremonies I prepared for, this is the one I feared the most. I knew I'd be weak and hungry, and who knows what else up there in the mountain, and that evening, I was to prepare for my symbolic death. And for as much work as I've done in the service of death and ceremony and ego loss, after divorce, bankruptcy, therapy, loss, and sweat lodges, health scares, I was terrified, really terrified. Was I willing to face whatever came up? Was I able to review my life and really let go? What if I opened up something that I couldn't handle? I was alone out there, and yes, that was the point. To face my past, weak and vulnerable and alone with only myself to answer and walk through the threshold unburdened because in the end that's the walk we all take so that evening i walked to the spot i had chosen days before i climbed the ridge to the base of the elder tree an ancient jack pine whose broad trunk was scarred from fire its desiccated top and limbs home to burrowed birds thunder was coming from the east and the sky started to brighten from lightning I placed fallen pine limbs in the ground in a sketch of a coffin. I placed items from my pack around the outside, objects representing family, friends, here and gone, ancestors, mine and the Ute people upon whose lands I stood. I called them all to witness my death, to offer guidance. I cried a list of parts of myself that were ready to die. Some parts carried on from childhood trauma, some protective, some not, but they no longer served. I gave thanks to those that were there to witness and those who accompanied me on my life journey. And I begged forgiveness to those I had hurt or wronged. And I was emptied and I was ready. And then I stepped naked and laid on the stones in that makeshift coffin. 
Uh, I won't get into here what came in those moments, but the storm was there. So I broke apart my shelter. I packed my totems and I walked back to the windy dark to my site. A little spatially disoriented, but keenly aware of the fact that I was not the same person that walked to that site an hour before. The next one. And the next one, please. This aspect of ceremony was a journey to the underworld. Like many described in stories and myths throughout time, these rituals open us up to the cyclical natures of life and death. And they help us facilitate a way to enter and navigate these processes in ways that modern society and systems just are not built for. I believe that these rituals and ceremonies, as well as time spent in nature, are deeply important aspects of death work, of teaching, of art, and of relationships. They connect us in community, to ancestral knowledge, and to our place in the wheel of life. They have been with us for generations, and with time and practice, I believe that we can return to them. Thank you. Do we do questions and answers now? A little later? Right now. Thank you.